right. So let us get into our wonderful message today. Hopefully it's encouraging for you. Um, we're going to follow up from last week. So let's just kind of pay attention and see what was covered last week, and then we'll catch up. Today, we're going to finish the story of Joseph. I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, I've been waiting for the ending of this one for a while, but it's a, it's, it is a good one. So here we go. Um, I'm taking you through this, this series called Navigating Forward because as we try to look at the future, which is hard to do, um, how do we plan? How, do we, how can we lay a foundation for the things we may face, the things we know we're going to face, things we don't know we're going to face? And the story of Joseph is a perfect one of that. So the second lesson is learn from those who've gone before you. You don't know it all. And that's what Joseph's story is about. He's one who has gone before us way back. He's one of the best stories that I've seen so far. So the first uh, message we talked about was the attitude of gratitude, that if you're going to look forward, you got to begin with thanksgiving and contentment and being in a place of contentment. Um, so far in the story, we've got Joseph dreams, a special coat. Um, he checks on his brothers, gets uh, thrown in a pit, sold as a slave. And they plot a great cover-up. Scene two was he gets sold uh, to Potiphar. Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. Then he accuses him of attempted rape. Uh, Potiphar throws him in jail, ticked off. Scene three, he's obviously tossed in jail. God shows favor uh, on Joseph in jail. Joseph then interprets two dreams and then begs not to be forgotten, but he's forgotten. Well, two years later, uh, it's about time, ha ha, um, he ends up getting out of jail, telling a dream uh, to the king. Uh, the butler does remember him finally and uh, tells the king about, or Pharaoh, about uh, the dream teller. And then he moves from being in jail and then becomes the, one of the greatest leaders in Egypt, second to the Pharaoh. So last week we talked about, uh, we ended up talking about his new name. So his name, Joseph, he was not referred to as Joseph. He was given an Egyptian name. Uh, he's given a family. He's given a wife. He ends up having children. He's given the top leadership role in the land. And he gets right to work. He doesn't immediately um, start enjoying the fringe benefits of his role. Um, which is pretty wild. And then the famine arrives. And this is where we take off today to scene six. This is the final scene in the story, and it's going to be a doozy. Uh, so I hope, if you don't know the story, this is a great reminder. If you haven't been to science school since you were like five or ten, uh, this is going to be another wonderful um uh, reminder of, of the story that you may have forgotten, especially some of the details. So now we've got this famine that's going on. It's been seven years of great food and prosperous land and blah, 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 blah. Um, but Jacob, back home, uh, Joseph's dad, realizes, uh-oh, we're, we're in trouble too. Because the prediction was everywhere was going to be a horrific famine for seven years. And so Joseph, uh, while he's leading all the food supply stuff in um uh, in Egypt, he now is uh, um, he's taking care of getting everybody fed. So we've got Jacob then hearing about the food, goes and sends his sons to Egypt. But this is where things start to take a turn. This is where the story gets very interesting. And you can take it the wrong way. I have a There's two ways to see what's going on here in Joseph's mind. So I hope you're going to capture um, uh, the heart of it because it does come out later. It, it's really important because Joseph has learned some things in his time in prison and in the jail. Since Joseph was governor of all of Egypt, and this is in Genesis 42, and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was him that his brothers came to. When they arrived, they bowed before him with their faces to the ground, and Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, probably because they haven't changed much. But I guarantee Joseph has his, his probably a different shaved look, because the Hebrews, they didn't shave, really, they, the beards were the big thing up in Egypt. Hardly ever saw people with beards. It was mostly shaven look, so everything would have changed. Their their brother was a teenager when they sold him. So if some of you remember pictures of when you were a teen to what you look like now, it's very different. So it's not unlike you know, it's believable that his brothers didn't recognize him. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where are you from? he demanded. Now, huh. 
Well, let's talk about the harshness in just a second. From the land of Canaan, they replied, we have come to buy food. And although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. And he remembered the dreams he'd had about them years before. And he said to them, you are spies. You've come to see how vulnerable our land has become. Why would Joseph get so ticked off? Well, some of us could say right away, well, he's going to do payback. He's in the greatest position ever. He's going to shove it in their face that, hey, uh, I told you you'd be bound before me. Start bound, boys. And uh, that's I don't think that's what was going on at all. I think he was beginning to exercise prudence. He had learned leadership. He would learned not to react with emotions. Um, he knew there was a way to navigate through to find out the intention of somebody because he's learned a lot of skills by now. So then it goes on, sir, they said, we are actually 12 of us. We, your servants, are all brothers. It's funny they mentioned 12 when they're, they've only been living with 11. Um, we've been living with a son, uh, sorry, we're all brothers, sons of a man living in the land of Canaan. Our youngest brother is back with our father right now. And, uh, and one of our brothers is no longer with us. Ha, the one they're talking to. But Joseph insists, as I said, you are spies. This is how I will test your story. I swear by the life of Pharaoh that you will never leave Egypt unless your youngest brother comes here. Okay, why would he do that? Why is he asking for his younger brother? Um, from all that I'm catching from this story so far, my hunch is he is testing his brothers now. He's testing their true heart because he saw how he was tossed out. And if his brothers are still of the same mindset, the same attitudes, what have they done to their brother? Are they lying about the brother? Did they kill Benjamin as well? Um, like, what, what's the deal here? So he's really digging deep and trying to find out if these guys have changed. Because, folks, we change as we grow older. We're supposed to change. We're supposed to be more mature. We're supposed to become more loving. We're supposed to become more understanding. We see the problems of other people. We see the mistakes of others. We see our own mistakes growing up and how we need mercy for the stuff we've done. Now we get to give that mercy to others. Joseph is growing up. This is one of those life lessons. The brothers bicker over who to blame for selling Joseph because in the text, I don't have time to read the whole text because it's so long. This is like chapters and chapters of stuff. But please go read um, this story all the way through. There's a lot of details here that will surprise you. It's eyebrow raising for sure. But they start to blame over, oh shoot, we're getting blamed now for what we did to our brother Joseph. Oh no, you know, karma is coming back on us. Oh no, we're in trouble. Um, and they recognize that. They connected the dots immediately, which is very interesting. Well, Joseph sends them home, but he puts one of the brothers in jail as security, as a surety that they will come back with Benjamin. Otherwise, why would they come back? So one of them ends up Simeon. He stays there. Now think, listen, I think it's two years he's in jail. They left their brother in an Egyptian jail for two years because uh, that's how long it took. I think, I think that's how it worked. I forget. Um, but it, it was a long time before they had to come back for more food because they're out. Well, Joseph sends them home, um, but he put all their money back in their bags plus extra supplies for the trip home. So here he blesses his family, throws the money back in that they paid, and gives them extra supplies for the trip. So that, that's, that's pretty generous. Well, Jacob reluctantly uh, sends Benjamin with his brothers. By the way, they're freaked out in between. They see their money is there. They're going, oh, no, we're going to get accused of stealing. Oh, no, we're in deep trouble. So by the time um, they, uh, uh, Jacob sends his, his family back and finally agrees to send Benjamin, his really next favorite son, because Joseph's gone. He thinks Joseph is wiped off the face of the earth. He sends gifts and presents and anything to show generosity back to uh, to Egypt and whoever was giving them this hard time. And please tell them this was in our bags. We didn't know this. So I know anyway, Joseph then meets them and he tests them again with a banquet. And here's it's kind of funny because they all sit down and he places them in order of their age from the oldest down to the youngest. I think that probably would have freaked them out. So how does anyone know this? That's bizarre. But they also noticed that Benjamin was being favored. He was given extras, extras, and extras. 
again, I believe this was a test. They're trying to test. Do you remember when Jacob showed favoritism to Joseph and the brothers got jealous? Well, now Joseph is showing favoritism to Benjamin. He's watching their reactions. Are they going to be jealous? Are they going to want, uh, are they, do they still have the same attitude? This is a really great story for this. And Joseph is overcome with emotion. So he gives them a final test. This, this test really stinks. Oh my goodness. You talk about really <laughs> almost payback. This is, this is incredible. So he gives them final test, sends them back home with the payment for the food back in the supplies, as well as, listen to this, he then um, uh, puts a silver cup, his own special silver cup. He, he instructs the people to put it into Benjamin's bag as if it's been stolen. Oh my, this is like a super shakedown. It's incredible. I'd hate to be one of the brothers. They are eating serious crow right now. So guess what happens on the way after they left Egypt they get chased down by Egyptians and they're brought back to Egypt and they're stunned and they're saying wait a minute uh, you think a cup we think we stole a cup oh my goodness whoever stole if you find the cup in any of our bags kill us who cares like we didn't do that and they find it in Benjamin's bag and they're devastated they're going what this our dad's going to kill us. And Joseph saw the honest terror in their hearts. So he went right down to the, the, the harshest place of emotion, probably the truest place. Okay? Call it brokenness. Call, call this the, the releasing of all of our self-control. And they realized, oh, no. And uh, Joseph threatened to keep Benjamin as a slave. And they beg and beg and beg. And they plead their case. Well, finally, in chapter 45, Joseph finally caves and he weeps out loud, which you don't do, but he couldn't help it. He just, that's it. Okay, it's over. Guys, it's me. It's Joseph. I'm your brother. And it's like, what? And the very first question he asks, is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. Well, I'd be too. Put yourself in that situation. In fact, I wonder if it's a, it was a maybe a double terror. Uh, now they're seeing crap. We're in trouble. Oh shoot! It's Joseph, the one we caused all this trouble to. Oh my! I uh, yeah yeah. You get it. you get the picture. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother whom you sold into slavery. But it didn't stop there because that could have been a dig. He says, but don't be upset. This is, this is true love, folks. This is maturity from pain we've gone through. All right. This is the fruit, the healthy fruit of difficult situations we may have gone through in our past. He says, don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. Wow. He attributes, attributes sorry, all this stuff to God. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of Egypt of all. Oh my goodness. Folks, uh, this is a tough lesson. We, we think we're so strong. We think we're so smart, so clever, and so powerful to add to the direction of things going on around us. Just like the brothers, they, they know full well what they did. They've been living with this guilt and shame for a very long time. And here, Joseph has arrived at a place where he says it was, it was God. That takes time. It takes time to mature and see that. And he was of a character that did take it the right way. So chapter 45, Joseph sends for his father and promised to take care of his entire family. 
So Joseph sent his brothers off, and as they left, listen to this, this is hilarious. Don't quarrel about this along the way, guys. I know you guys, you're going you're gonna to fight. It was your fault, it's your fault. No, it was my fault. If only you, if only you. <laughs> you can imagine siblings <laughs> fighting over this, including brothers who probably would physically fight over this. Too, too funny. Joseph then sends them on their way. Jacob discovers that his son is alive. Now listen, how are the brothers going to explain this with but no, no other way but the truth? They had to eat serious crow <laughs> before their dad. Their dad is going to see the true colors of their past and the lie they've been hiding all these years. And finally, they come back. Jacob comes towards Egypt. J Joseph and Jacob embrace at last, and then Jacob blesses Joseph's sons. This is the best part. This is, this is an amazing part of the story. I, I uh, please catch this. Okay, this is this is really cool. And I, this little connection I didn't find uh, on my own. Uh, a, a good friend, Lonre from uh, Saskatoon, uh, a doctor and a, pa a speaker, teacher guy. Uh, there who revealed this to me. I loved it. I think you'll enjoy this too. This, this is the part I'm excited about. Joseph moved the boys. And again, he's, he's going to get his father's blessing on his two boys. Um, great names here too. So Joseph moved the boys who were at their grandfather's knees and he bowed with his face to the ground. Then he positioned the boys in front of Jacob because Jacob wouldn't know uh, the ages of the kids or who's who, okay, not correctly. With his right hand, he directed Ephraim toward Jacob's left hand. And with his left hand, he put Manasseh at Jacob's right hand, okay? But Jacob crossed his arms. He went like this. All right. So Joseph put his put tried to direct his dad's hands on how to bless and who to bless, because one would get a, a first blessing, the other one would get the second or lesser blessing. Okay, that's how it worked. Firstborns or whoever would get the, get the bigger blessing, but that's not what happened. Jacob crossed his arms. I never caught this ever before, folks. This is this is new to me. It's all there. It's, it's been around for two thousand, you know, a long, long time. This story. So Jacob crossed his arms and reached out to lay his on the, hands on the boy's head. He put his right hand on the head of Ephraim instead, though he was the younger boy, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, though he was firstborn. Interesting. But Joseph was upset. He said, "Dad, what are you doing? I, I'm I'm telling you. You know, are you are you forgetting?" Uh, have you ever been frustrated with your older parents? I uh, I sure have, multiple times. <laughs> we don't think we think that as they get older, they're they're not as with it. Oh, don't you kid yourself! Don't you kid yourself! Just because the external ain't working the way they want it to in here, holy smokes! There are some things ticking just fine. So Joseph was upset when he saw that his father placed his right hand on Ephraim's head. So Joseph lifted it to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. No, my father, he said, this is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused. Listen to this. I know, my son. I know, he replied. Manasseh will become a great people, but his younger brother will become even greater, and his descendants will become a multitude of nations. This is a prophecy and a blessing all at once. So Jacob, Jacob blessed the boys that day with this blessing. The people of Israel will use your names when they give a blessing. They will say, may God make you as prosperous as Ephraim and Manasseh. In this way, Jacob put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Why is this so important? Hmm. This is where Lonry really helped me with this. Why did he do this? Well, I'm going to read to you because this is a copy and paste and I'm going to, because I can't, worded any better this is well done manessa means deliverance and the meaning of ephraim is fruitfulness thus when you put manessa ahead of ephraim the normal order like joseph did you are saying that you want to be delivered and then be fruitful which makes sense 
However, when you put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh, the reverse order, like Israel did, or Jacob, you are saying, it is your fruitfulness that will deliver you. This is so different, which seems not to make sense ordinarily, but is the order of blessing for the children of God. This is for you and me. We have fruitfulness and we are delivered. <laughs> to understand this reverse order better, just take a look at the life of Joseph himself. It was his fruitfulness in jail that led to his deliverance. His attitude of goodness and kindness and gentleness and understanding and empathy and sympathy. Hearing the dreams of co-prisoners, um, having God's blessing on him. He was prosperous and fruitful in those terrible circumstances. What's our attitude when things go bad? What's our attitude when things are taken from us or perceivedly taken from us? Do we whine and gripe and complain and, oh, I'm going to the garden to eat worms? Do we have a negative attitude? Do we say, oh, the world's getting worse and worse? Do we run to conspiracy theories, people? Do we say, oh, no, the world's coming to an end. Oh, please stop it. You're made better than that. You're made to look for the light, to look for hope, to look for goodness. Here, we continue this. But by putting Manasseh ahead of Ephraim, Joseph was saying in essence that you couldn't be fruitful unless you're delivered. That's what he thought. But Jacob reversed that order when he placed Ephraim's ahead of Manasseh by saying that it is your fruitfulness that leads to your deliverance. Another example of this is when our Lord and Savior, even in his affliction, he was fruitful. And it was his fruitfulness that led to our deliverance on the cross. Ooh, ooh, this is good. Oh my goodness. Second Corinthians 4, 16 to 17. <laughs> so no wonder we don't give up. For even though our outer person gradually wears out, our inner being is renewed every single day. We view our slight, short-lived troubles in light of eternity. We see our difficulties as the substance that produces for us an eternal, weighty glory, far beyond all comparison, because we don't focus our attention on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen, and, uh, but the unseen realm is eternal. Here's an application. As children of God, the order of our blessing is Ephraim Manasseh, meaning that it is our fruitfulness that leads to our deliverance. Be encouraged. Take your eyes off of this temporal world. Maybe you learned a lesson through this whole election thing and got swayed to one side or the other because it was dualism that was creating the fighting here, okay? Perhaps you get to eat some crow right now and realize, wait a minute, I uh, maybe I... Um, maybe I did kind of listen too much to the negative. Yeah, that was called the world news going on. Take a look at the what is eternal. You've got the eternal in you. Focus on that. There's not enough good news going out today. We need more light bearers, torch bearers. We need more people sharing, speaking, and thinking the light of Christ, the truth of Christ, good news. Really, really, really important. Oh, my goodness. All right. So here we have the story of the dreamer boy. Mocked for his dreaming, the thing they mocked became a tool used to move him to the place he was destined to be. Careful who you mock and what you mock them for. We're, we're wired to make fun of things. I remember uh, uh, there was a, a meme or story of a teacher who was doing multiplication questions and it was like the nine times table so one times nine is seven two times nine is eight, 18 three times nine is 27 all the way down through and all the kids in the class are laughing giggling because because obviously one of them was one of the answers was wrong and the teacher turned that around as a lesson saying kids do you not see I, I made all the other ones right but you focused on the one mistake and this is how the world will treat you from this kind of mistake so how quickly lesson for you and i is how quickly do we draw attention to the mistake and focus on that and look and make fun of it or uh trying to correct the mistake when there are other things that are more important i'm speaking to myself here this is a good lesson so this dreamer kid the one who told his family about the dreams 
and those dreams came true. They really did. This is, this is one of the few stories in Scripture where dreams play a major role in, uh, in the life of this main character. Careful what and who you mock. God may be playing out someone else's future through you. <laughs> it's not impossible. His maturing journey exhibited the fruit of forgiveness. I remember the, if you remember back, I think it was last week or the week before, when Joseph named his sons, he named Manasseh um, in the, uh, with the idea and intent of the bitterness has left me. You know, he, he didn't look on his brothers and family and what they did to him with the bitterness any longer. You'll never forget what happened. Those, the, the factual objective le uh, things that happened, he it won't be forgotten, but he doesn't have to associate bitterness with it and unforgiveness because he'd learned to forgive. He'd learned to look back when, by the time he confronted his brothers, he was able, because he had forgiven, he was able to confront and go deeper. There's a huge lesson there to learn. Uh, in fact, I should probably bring that story into the forgiveness series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to write that down. That's good. That's really good. Because he, he was not able to confront properly until he had forgiven them. Because you notice his attitude changed. He was actually trying to figure out. He was holding, to, holding them to account. They did not automatically um, benefit restoration instantly just because. He was testing them. He was making sure their attitudes had changed and clearly they had. Incredible. Your attitude matters. People see your attitude. What's the vibe you send off? And trust matters. Who do you trust? Do you trust your Heavenly Father? Do you trust the one who is in you? The one who holds all things together? I, I hope so. As we navigate forward, this is, this is going to be a good series i'm not done this is we got more coming next week's uh, number five so i i hope you enjoy this uh it, it's a it's a great one all right that's it for today uh, a couple more things uh, to close out